Alright, so, do, 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 a bit of a noisy one. Hello, 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 thanks for joining us, and I've got another model to paint. 
Another model to paint. I've got a little bit of reference art that I'm going to be going to um, by the fantastic Ariana, and all credit to her for the for the awesome art. And we're going to be trying to copy this particular paint style. And what you might be able to hear in the background is my compressor. Uh, my compressor on my airbrush is going because I'm actually going to try and hit some of the transitions to kind of I've had a little bit of a, a little bit of a kind of practice just trying to get some of the the colors right so uh, we're gonna have a little play with the airbrush uh, which is not nearly as as daunting as as we might think so um, I'm gonna load the airbrush up and what I'm gonna probably do I think looking at the um, looking at the reference is a majority of the color is gonna be light green the easiest I'm gonna have to do it in two, two zones I think so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint blue around the back here and then I'm going to paint the blue across the, the top uh, surface. Uh, that will be the first job and then I think I'm going to airbrush the transition over the top. So I've got a blue colour here. Here so we can actually just start painting. So. this blue one. I've not put any music on. I think Russ is going to join us shortly. Checking what we've got going on. Mini. And as with every model I do, the first little bit is probably the least interesting. Just while we're getting uh, first colours in. I'm going to paint the full volume. I'm not too worried about how scratchy it looks at the bottom here because that's obviously going to get covered by the... Uh, by the... I don't know what colour this. Like, um... Aquary sort of colour? And then across the back, assume so I'm trying to block this out like this so I can save myself the hassle of. Airbrushing two colours, but I rather suspect that that's. What I'm also doing is focusing on the more messy parts of the model, which will be the airbrushing, which will definitely overspray into areas. Building up this colour, we're going to go in with an ink wash. Probably once I've done the initial work. So I'm absolutely blown away by how many people have um, enjoyed the the work that Ross has done and, and me getting a chance to kind of paint these minis. It's fantastic. I hope. People do enjoy it as much as we're enjoying putting uh, putting a little channel together to kind of have some fun doing these models. Right, I think time for that to dry, and I'm going to start loading up the loading up the airbrush with the uh, the light colour. So we're going to grab a little bit of thinner. in the airbrush and so got a little bit thinner in the bottom here have a little bit this color don't really need an awful lot 
And what we are going to do is I don't want to spray on my lovely map. I'm going to whack it on again. So apologies for any of the uh, overspray with the noise. What I'm doing here is I'm just testing how thick the paint is. I don't want it to come out too runny. I want it to be quite controllable as I, as I spray it through. That's better. Okay. Right, so looking at the bottom of a we're just going to start at the bottom. Paint is not coming out as I want it to. There you go. the nozzle on that. So the key key to painting with any kind of painting, whether you use a brush or a, or an airbrush, is build your layers up slowly. Oh my god, alright, that's it, I'll give up, I'm gonna have to... We're going to have to do it the hard way. Alright. We'll clean that colour out and then we'll go in with the dark stuff. This is going to be uh, an emotional experience. This is the hardest part of this particular colour scheme. Everything else is pretty straightforward. a little bit thinner through the through the brush a little bit of the color going go with this nice rich Tesla blue is called so, yeah, just mixing it in the bowl
Right, this is where it could all go horribly wrong. Build this colour up first. Yes. I do not want to see what's going on. You know, sometimes you get like the flow and it just works perfectly. Other times it just doesn't want to play. Try and make it a fraction thinner. So now I'm going to angle the model down and straighten away. So just going to try and get the bottom part of the cloak. Kind of happy about that transition. Get that across the. Oh, you monkey. Alright. That, I reckon, will do us. So let's kill that. There, we'll quickly clean this out on the way to get, and then I'll regret it tomorrow. So I'll just quickly clear the airbrush out. Obviously, uh, if there's any questions, uh, I'm more than happy to answer anything you might want to know about what I'm doing, or uh, why I'm doing it a certain way. I'm certainly not the world's best paint up. Kind of quick, so I can paint the model to a decent standard in about an hour, hour and a half usually. Right, nearly all done with this, and then we can go on to some interesting things. Right. Sit there and just have a little stew in its own juices. All right, good. Clear that away, clear that out of the way, and we are back. Keep reaching across, I'm gonna pour my water over here. It's gonna make life a lot easier. Good, so first things first I wanna do with this is gonna be get a really, really, really light green wash onto this because I just wanna pick out some of the details. Um what I'm gonna do is like I say. Really light green wash. Kind of give it that green tint that you can see in the uh, in the artwork. It also does help me stand transitions are between the different surfaces. So this is effectively part wash, it's mostly a filter. So I'm just trying to use it just to change the color tones. Am I gonna paint any Gautier minis? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I have got a bunch of 3D masters. Um, 
the guys promised me I'm getting some metal minis coming down. So I will definitely be doing a series on uh, painting those models up. For sure. Did you get in on the early access? All right, cool. Well, that's dry and we won't waste any time. We'll get diving into the leggings. It looks like the leggings are going to be my fairly standard uh, black and brown. One of the reasons why I like black and brown um, so much is because it is a dark, dark um, brown color. Um, and I have a habit when I'm painting the mini of uh, painting the, the bottom half as dark as I possibly can because I think it makes the... Um, stand out a bit more so with that in mind it makes me happy that the artwork shows the model with brown leggings uh, sorry brown wraps on her feet yeah I was chatting with um, our uh, dispatch guys apparently all the models were in all the boards and whatnot or all the dice are in everything's in they're just waiting for one particular box which they're gonna um, send them out in just to make sure the models get to you safe and sound they're due in Tuesday I believe start sending them out almost straight away Right, so got the uh, got the leggings down. What else can we do while we're waiting for our ink to dry? We can definitely do the bow stuff. I'm gonna go with a black base on this. Quite dark in the artwork, and then I will probably add a little bit of interest to it via some brown. I have to be careful here. I'm going to leave that bit. Otherwise, I'm going to end up making myself sad. Especially when we're talking about airbrush surface. Okay. That is going to be a nightmare if I get a mistake on that. It's not yeah, mess about. Be yeah. sensible about these things. Cool. Right. I'm going to grab a bit of a dark, sort of slaty colour. Bring out her pantaloons. Like this will probably again get. Bit of a green ink wash. There'll be some interesting textures here. We have to try and do a little bit of cross hatching. Imply texture that Mariana's put into the part. Oh, I'm glad you like it. Yeah, like honestly, the, um, uh, Alex and DC are working um, full time on uh, on job tier now, and stuff that they're doing really exciting. I can't wait to get my models and uh, crack into it. Right, so 
kind of get this by it. This is all dark, which is good. Happy. I'm going to have to come in over the top of this again once. Right. Okay, and then other one. That. Hello mate. Hello mate, how you doing? Not bad. Not bad at all, you? I am good. Hello the internet. I am calling in now. You you hit me all sorts of ways. I I thought it was best not to surprise you. I found that a <laughs> stunt a stunned painter is a bad painter. It can be. You missed the uh, the most dramatic bit, which was um the airbrushy bit. Oh, I didn't miss it. I was there in spirit whilst I was walking my dog. I had uh, I had you on my phone, so I was watching as I walked around. All oh, right, yeah, it was. Um, I was trying to get away with um, with just doing one coat, and then deep down, we all knew that I was going to have to do both colours. <laughs> so, just trying to work out where the kind of big blocks of colour are across this sort of upper surface here. I'm going to be interested to see how you handle her um, skin because although it's, I don't think it's been explicitly discussed what her ethnicity is in the show, there's definitely a sense from the artwork that she's got, I don't know, maybe Hispanic or, or some sort of Mediterranean quality to her skin. So it'll be really interesting seeing how you uh, develop that. Yeah, the, well, the, the key to it, as, as, you, as you know, as a, as a good painter yourself, is... Um... It's the subtones, isn't it? So it's getting mm. getting a nice kind of green subtone into it, which I think will lend itself well in with the whole model. Yeah, I think so. She's it. It, it keeps that kind of almost water-like elemental quality. Yeah, I mean, she's got a touch of the uh, Last Airbender about her, really. Yeah. So this is I keep. Slightly apologising, this is the most boring bit, as you know. <laughs> so uh, I'm I'm here to uh, to, to blatantly uh, pimp my own broadcast. Uh, I'm thinking it's going to be Thursday once I've got all of the technical elements set up at my end, and uh, we're going to be doing some live sculpting and cool. get a D get a D and D figure going. It's going to be it's going to be epic. Have you got any ideas about who you're going to do? Ooh, well, I've got a couple of choices. It depends what I do in the next few days, because I've got my own D&D character on the screen. Oh, right. That, that I'm working on. I've also got uh, a uh, critical role character on the screen. And uh, I've got a few other ideas as well. So who can say it's a it's a whole, whole thing that could uh, go in many directions? Um, that sounds noticed... intriguing. Well, I know I've been looking on Twitter, and uh, in response to some of the things I've posted, there's definitely a move for Victor to get done. Oh, nice. Uh, critical Role fans out there, you'll know Victor. Um, I quite fancy uh, fancy a crack at him. He's going to be an interesting character to do. Which version, though? Because does he not blow bits of his body off? He does, and uh, I did a I did a rough out for him today. And uh, I've realised that it has too many fingers, so I need to um, I need to do something about that. Does that even need? You need a new modified finger brush. You got too many fingers in your finger brush. I do. My finger brush has too many options. Hmm. But uh, Bo's looking lovely. 
I'm pretty happy with the transition. Yeah. Certainly, the getting some glazes on there will start like you know bringing them out a little bit. Yeah, just a bit more saturation, but uh, that, like you say, that can come through the glazing and washing. The the you know as an underlayer, that, yeah, that's tonally really nice. Yeah, it's interesting that green kind of glaze wash that I did didn't really um it could benefit with going in again to be honest with you. Well, these are these you can always add but you can't take away with with glazes, so it's always a good idea to do it in several gradual stages. Yeah. There speaks the voice of experience. Uh yes. <laughs> Learn from my mistakes. <laughs> Glazes are like haircuts. No, he's cut a bit more off. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were gonna say you and I don't need them anymore. Well no, that that is also true. Oh, I need glazes in my life. I don't know where I'd be without them. That's fair. I think that's gonna be the secret with um with Bo's skin is uh is making sure that I get some nice green subtones in. The thing is with um ladies uh flesh female flesh is always very tricky because if you're not careful you can make them a fraction too manly mm -hmm. um so you've got to be quite quite wary of how how much you push it the same the same issues with painting female skin and sculpting female miniatures um i think i think there's a parallel between the two which is that um I don't know if it's uh, if it's uh, a social construct or just the way that we interpret things, but generally I find that you can push uh, sort of the extreme nature of male skin and male features when I'm sculpting quite a lot. There's a lot of exaggeration and almost caricature that you can do, yeah. and the model will hold up. But uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, the same when you're working with uh, doing a female model I find that if I want to have a miniature feel realistic or capture character, the subtlety of what you can and can't get away with is is really surprising. It's it's definitely a different challenge. Yeah. Very enjoyable challenge, but it's definitely a different challenge. I think that's certainly true with painting female skin. Um, there's a there's a definitely a different set of considerations because you're still trying to get that same depth. You know, you're still trying to get that same level of contrast and and blend and and life yeah but but you can't have anything harsh or craggy because then you lose the you lose the character unless you're doing you know a very elderly person but for someone like Bo who's in her early 20s you you've got quite a limited range of 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 palette that you can work with but you've still got to find that contrast so it's it's it's, it's an interesting one I am definitely not nearly as good at painting female faces as I am male faces, that's for sure. Male faces, like you say, they're a lot more forgiving when you push the boundaries. Think, yeah, I think also, you know, there's there's a. It's still the case that you've probably painted more male faces than female faces over the years, because until quite recently, the vast majority of miniatures were male characters. You're only now starting to really see a good range of quality female figures out on the market. True, and it's a, I think it's a very, very, very welcome and much overdue development. Well, we spend quite a lot of time talking about it and working on it with the uh, Gilborn God tier, don't we? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, having a diverse cast of characters, it, it's mo it's not, you know, it. it it's beneficial to the game. It's beneficial just from a narrative perspective before you consider any other things because it gives us a wider set of voices and a bigger canvas that we can play with. Yeah. Uh, are these minis going into production? It's a good question. We don't know. Maybe. We don't know yet. We'll see. Over the moment, if they did. At the moment, we're doing this for funsies. This is purely for fun. Um, you know... We managed to um, get a couple of got um, got the model, got Caleb in front of um, Liam and Matt uh, yesterday, and they seem to like what they see, um, which was very encouraging. So, who knows? I mean, we'll take each step as it comes. Like we say at the moment, we're just doing this for fun, um, largely because Russ and I, like we talked about yesterday, 
I love painting and Russ loves sculpting, so yeah. that's why we get on so well. I think the answer, the, the short answer is, if we can, we will. <laughs> yeah, why not? Right, I'm going to boringly have to do another ink wash, and then I'll have to do some kind of, I don't know, song and dance routine that's a little bit more entertaining than watching ink dry. I don't know what that is, no. but... No, beats me. I think this model's going to be a lot quicker than yesterday's. Well, she the nature of the design, she's um, not simple in a simplistic sense, but simple in an uncluttered sense. Whereas, you know, Caleb had all of the sort of rags and tatters. You know, this is a this is a monk character. This is a character that's got some clean lines, some good separation. Yeah. What's your um, what's your take on monks in D and D? Because they are one of the more controversial character classes, and some people yeah, they are. love them, and some people do not. Um, I'm ambivalent. I have absolutely no problem with someone playing a monk in my game. I will work hard to make it uh, feel part of the world. Uh, it's not a class that I would personally choose to play, but that might just be because I've never had a strong concept for it. Right. But um, I don't. I don't consider them as uh, controversial as uh, psionics, which is something I have a real problem with in in D and D. Um, right. As a, as a player character ability. Uh, but yeah, monks are all right. I mean, I think the latest version in fifth edition, I think mechanically they work better than they have previously. They certainly feel more part of the world than they used to. Right. So uh, I, from that respect, it's all good. Um, and I think one of the nice things watching watching um, Marisha playing Beauregard is she's, you know, sort of showing that there are more than, you know, monks don't have to be stoic, rice-eating dudes that sit on the top of a mountain and talk about balance you know they can they can be hard drinking fun machines as well which is which is cool yeah it kind of goes back to what we were talking about yesterday i think that you know the explosion of of internet based uh role playing and streaming and seeing being able to sort of you know jump onto and see different games is it's helping redefine what you can do with a character archetype opening up uh, new possibilities i mean my cleric that i'm about to play is very different to the sort of cleric i would have played in the past uh, it's not been a class i've done much of um because i've never had a strong idea for them but uh, i'm really looking forward to to getting on with my guy it's going to be good times who's running uh my bro is he uh, yeah be good yeah, gm he is, yeah, he's good. Um, we have a very similar, as in all things, we have a very similar outlook on um, on GMing. You know, he's a story is king kind of guy. Um, right. uh, he doesn't run as uh, uh, many different systems. He's, he he loves Star Wars. He loves um, D and D. Um, he was a big fan of the. Uh, remember in the sort of um, late nineties, early two thousands, there was a slew of kind of. Hollywood um, sort of Hong Kong action movie type games like the Feng Shui game. Feng Shui, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was he was all he was all up for that. He loves all of that kind of hokey kung fu stuff. Um, but yeah, he's running his D and D. He's setting it in um, Taldere in the Critical Role universe. Is he? So, yeah, it's going to be cool. We're um, yeah. So my monks, I've got got my background all worked out where I come from. All of that jazz. It's a good book. I've got the. It's actually sat in front of me for research purposes. The uh, Critical Role campaign book. It's a lovely little volume. When did that come out? Um, not not that long ago. All oh, right. Okay. Um, with it within the last. Oh, what's it say on it? I think it came out in the it was within the last twelve months, and I think it's towards the back end of last year. Very good. I might have to so pick that up. I didn't know that was out. Yeah, it's very nice. And of course, as they are fond of telling you, um, um, if you use DND Beyond, the uh, online character system, which is really good, right? Um, you can un you they they've incorporated the Critical Role content, so you can have the Critical Role character classes like Blood Hunter. Um, oh, cool! All set up all set up in there and ready to roll. 
this has been an advert for DND Beyond. <laughs> yeah, are you on, are you sponsored? Are you, you like getting anything I out wish. of this? Sadly not, but hey, you know, if anyone from I mean, it's owned by Twitch, so if anyone's listening, yeah. send me ten thousand dollars and a Ferrari, thank you. Sure, you're cheap. I've only mentioned them the once. I mean, you know, that's per mention. Fair, fair enough. That makes more sense. Right, good. So, um, I'm gonna have to wait for this ink to dry, aren't I? Before I can do anything dramatic over there. So let's um. Yeah, oh, while we wait for the ink, should we give a shout out to Doug for producing that awesome artwork that we've got up on the UI of you and me looking like Sesame Street characters? Yeah, how flash do we look? That's literally what we look like. It is. That's my passport photo. <laughs> could you imagine? Would it be awesome if you could use a caricature as your passport photo? Oh, it'd be brilliant. What it reminded me of, uh, this is this is a bit of an obscure segue, but I don't know if anyone's ever seen the Arlo. Um, Arlo is a guy that reviews Nintendo games, but he does it as a Sesame Street character. He's got a puppet, and it's the puppet that that does the videos. Right. And uh, he, he's a very good reviewer, but you're instantly kind of predisposed to think well of him because it's this Sesame Street character. Looks like the Cookie Monster. Brilliant. Um, it's just, just genius. You know, you see something on YouTube and go, damn, I wish I'd thought of that. Yeah, that's yeah. clever. Guy goes on as a Sesame Street character, six million followers. Boom. And spawns a slew of copycats, no doubt. Almost certainly. I mean, I'm sitting here painting in a cookie, uh, cookie monster outfit. I'm just off camera. That's just what you wear. It's That's Monday. Yeah. The old cookie, cookie monster onesie Monday. <laughs> I'd say the Critical Role community has been extremely good for my Twitter following. Really? Yeah, I, I, I've been on Twitter since. Oh my! I must be on Twitter for six years now, easily. And in that time, I've had about. 200 followers because right. I don't I don't tweet a huge amount and when I do I'm not that interesting a person and I've gone from 200 odd to nearly 1400 in just over a week amazing well there you oh, go it's it's, a, it's an amazing community it just goes to show if you put got good content out people are interested in finding out more about it I wouldn't say you're not an interesting person mate right. well it's not that I sit at home sobbing over why I don't have anything interesting to say to people, but I don't put a great deal out on social media. Well, there is that. I've never, I've never really got that habit. I think it's just a massive overhead. I go through fits and starts where I'm like, oh, I'm going to really interact with loads of people and make loads of new friends. And then like a week later, it's like, God, this is hard work, isn't it? Mm. Also, fundamentally, I sit in front of a computer making tiny, tiny people every day. It's very difficult to find interesting things to say on a <laughs> regular basis. We're not really and... setting ourselves up well for this stream, are we? Well, I, well, I was about to say, one of the great things about this stream is it allows us to generate content in terms of miniatures to sculpt, miniatures to paint that we can talk about at the time. Because in our day job, yep. uh, as uh, members of the uh, Steamforge Massive, most of what we work on is, you know, between six and twelve months ahead of release, and so we'd be shooting ourselves a foot in the foot a bit if we live streamed that. So it's nice to have an outlet where we can show show people kind of in the moment, and they can get excited when we're excited. Because I love what we do, and I love what we release, but there is sometimes a slight sense of people get all excited about something, and you're like, yeah, I was excited about that twelve months ago when I made it. Yeah, yeah. I used to get that with video games that I worked on. It's like, uh, see it in the shops and you're like, yeah. Well, the lead time on a video game must be even longer. I mean, you know, we're working sort of nine months ahead. I can imagine with video game stuff, it could be years. Well, surprisingly, when you finish your Gold Master, um, you're actually looking at around about 12 weeks to shelf. Gosh, as fast as that. That's amazing. Yeah. Um of course, in that 12 weeks, you've had all your time off in lieu from the crunch that you did, and you've caught up with your family, and you've stopped being sick, and you're back to work, and you're actually kicking off the next project, and you're kind of knee-deep in something new and shiny, and then suddenly you realise that it's actually the street date for, for the game you were working on a little while back, and you're like, huh, that's kind of interesting. And uh, 
maybe that's just me and my kind of psyches. I'm always more interested with the new stuff that I want rather than the stuff that I did a long time ago. It's always about the next thing. I think though that that that's uh, it's a, it's a uh, it's an artifact of being in any kind of creative industry is it takes far longer to create something than it takes to consume it. I sometimes think that about, you know, actors working on movies and they're, they're on the, the promotional tour because the film's out and, uh, you know, they might have, that film might have been in the can for two years and now they've got to get all enthusiastic about it and get out there and talk about it. And that's just, that's just the nature of the job. You know, yeah. that's, that's the world we're in. But then if there's anyone who is on 10 grand and a Ferrari every time they open their mouth, it'll be those guys. Well, there is that. You'd be willing to put up with a lot of that for those kind of rates. Probably a powerful motivating tool. <laughs> well, I once had someone say the nicest thing, though. When we were at Gen Con a couple of years back, a guy came up. Uh, he was a guy who ended up working for us, a guy called Andrew, really nice guy. Um, he works mainly on Hollywood stuff, but he was doing some gaming stuff um, as a sideline. He did some freelancing um, for us. And he said that, in his view... Um, like gaming, tabletop gaming, the kind of gaming that we're now involved with, mm. was was the best industry to be in as a creative. Because he said it, it, he's worked in video games and he's worked in movies and he's worked in visual effects. And he said, and there's more money in those endeavors, but for people like who just enjoy what they do on a day in day out basis and want to be there and are passionate and and love it. He said you get a greater number of those in tabletop and role playing games than you do in any other creative industry that he's been involved with. Right. Uh, he just he just was of the view that we've just got the best job, and uh, well, I'm not going to argue with him. You know. Some days I would agree, and some days I would not. But uh, yeah. that's like any job, isn't it? Yeah. But no, I think I think it's great. It's um, I would, I would not like to think of myself doing anything else other than this. Well, here we are. You know, a week ago, we were making some critical role models because we wanted to, because it was fun. It was a nice little side project. A week later, you know, Matt and Liam are, and Marisha are all liking our, um, liking the stuff and chatting on Twitter. And it's like, uh, you know, what, what, a, what, a, what a great time to be alive, to be able to be in a world where you can do that and just reach out and influence people. Yeah, well, it's the internet it makes the world a smaller place, isn't it? For good and ill. <laughs> do you, do yes. you get to enjoy your finished projects more in the board game industry than in video games? You're more likely to go back and play the board games you created than the video games. Well, anecdotally, uh, we had the um, Steam Forge Christmas Do, and uh, I got to play three games of Guild Ball at the Christmas Do. Yeah. I played Game of Guild Ball at Christmas too as well, yeah. So it was in some ways it was kind of cool, and in other ways it was kind of sad that all of us, um, even, like guys out of the dev team and everything, were like, uh, what do you want to do? Oh, let's have a Game of Guild Ball. All right, fair enough. So we're drinking whiskey and playing Guild Ball. So it's the best. So yeah, I I, I play Guild Ball very often. Um, I think a, a key thing there as well, that I think is is very relevant is unless you're probably working on a Nintendo title, everything that we work on is more social. Yeah. You know, our our games are the the original couch co-op. Um. So, like, I have plenty of computer games I love playing, but when my brother came round, it was my birthday. We were hanging out after everyone else had gone home, and we decided to have a two-player. Uh, Dark Souls drinking campaign. Oh, nice. How'd uh, that work out? It was messy, mm. but it was awesome. Mm. <laughs> it was absolutely awesome. We played the Dark Souls 1 campaign package and basically drank every time we cleared a room or every time one of us died. Oh, my God, we were absolutely leathered. But, yeah. you know, it was an amazing experience. And I don't know what video game we could have played and had the same same feeling. It was a blast. I like how you waited until everyone had gone home before you did that. Oh well, we're not stupid. Right. But that was a that was a day of gaming. I mean, we we there was uh, about half a dozen of us. We played Guild Ball in the morning. We played. Um, my wife got me Relic, which is like the 40k version of Talisman. We played that in the afternoon. Then we played uh, some Dark Souls in the evening, and then me and my bro did the Dark Souls drinking campaign. It's great. Is that an FFG game, the Relic. I think it might be. I think it might be. I don't know. It was recommended to me by my brother-in-law, 
who'd um, played it while he was living in Korea. And so uh, Kate got it me for my birthday. Hmm. I don't know if that's coming through, but um, I'm trying to put some cross hatching now just on the final highlight. Yeah, it's working. You're getting that kind of swaggy cloth feel. I take it again, this is going to be where you're going to hit some glazes in there to sort of tint it into that kind of greeny yeah. blue. Yeah, I just want a hint of the pattern that uh, Ariana's put into the material. Without... A big, I was going to say, sorry, a big part of really mastering cloth is having the kind of the, the, the bravery to try this kind of technique. I think the other thing with cloth as well is um, the difference um, in specularity between cloth and another material. Mm. And what that awesome. basically means is the highlights need to be a lot more diffuse. Um, nice. You can't have really sharp highlights on cloth, otherwise it just ends up looking a bit weird. So you have to kind of really spread the highlights out. There is definitely a style of painting used by, a, by some very good painters. Um, and certain companies even use it where they, they highlight everything to a very sharp edge. Even if you've got like a rolling fold, they'll put a sharp edge down the edge of it. And it's it's a slightly peculiar technique because it makes, like you say, it makes everything look like it's made of metal or, or plastic or ceramic. Yeah, I mean, it's the reason they do that is it's obviously it's easy to do, isn't it? Um, well. It's easier to paint. Please. Right, let's get in and just get this stuff done while I remember. So, are you brave enough to try and do any of the patterning on that, um, on that sort of collar area where she's got the overlapping V, or do you think that might just be a bridge too far? I don't know if I've actually got enough model space to work with. And that's the thing. I mean, this is it's it's a valid kind of thing to think about. Is what is appropriate for scale? Because you know. Uh, 2D art and 3D miniature that's like 30 odd mil tall will support different levels of detail. Yeah, I think what I might do is I might hint at it with the you've put like a nice little sort of braided edge, and I think I might kind of hit that with like a like a bit of a dark touch to it. That'd be nice. Yes, uh, that braided edge. That's a new technique developed just to do Beauregard was uh, that that braiding. Was it? Mm. How'd you do that? I, I took an existing uh, technique that I'd got for doing piping around an edge and uh, basically has the easiest way to explain it. There's a way of generating a curve around the edge of the fabric and you can get something to follow the edge. And up until now, I've been using continuous pipes to put like piped edges on things, which looks really good. Right. But this time I decided to uh, basically reconfigure the, um, the, the technique so that it would apply individual sp spheres touching each other and slightly sunken into the surface to give you like that sort of braid oh, um okay so uh now that the great thing about that is i've kind of proved the principle work so uh get ready to see a lot of patterned edges on models <laughs> i like it it's going to be one of those things that because it's a process not a specific thing i can use it in lots of different ways so i'm using um Oh, I'm desperately trying not to spit at the moment. But um, so talking yesterday about different flavors of paint, and uh, I'm on scale seventy five because I wanted to push it through the airbrush. And the more matte finish on the scale seventy five makes transitions a lot easier to kind of achieve. Oh, wow. mm -hmm. Um, enough taste bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you the worst tasting paint in my personal experience. I'm not. I'm not a fan of scale 75. Not being an airbrush user, you know, I'm as old school as it comes. But uh, the two paints that you never want to get in your mouth are GW washes, just because they're vile. Yeah. yeah. But I also a lot of my metallic work is done with the Tamiya paints, which have an alcohol oh, base. Nice. You do not. You do not want to lick your brush when you're when you're working with those things. They, no. That is bad news, man. It is a sad time. No, it might just be the camera angle, but it looks like you've got a bit of um, uh, pigment separation in one of those cloth folds. Where the, yeah, you you do you know what the cause of that is and what people can do to avoid it? Uh, yeah, uh, washing models. I think that's uh, a bit of release agent or sort of three D printing agent that I haven't cleaned out. Uh -huh. 
I it'll be it'll be isopropyl it. alcohol on the surface if it's a 3D print. Yeah. I, I, usually that's why I, I attribute it to when it happens. It's fine. You like um, we just need to kind of build up a little bit. Yeah, you can work. You can work into it for sure. But I just know that it's a common problem that people have. I think sometimes. I don't know, I may be wrong, but I, I I found that I get it if I've really over watered an ink and I've actually basically I've I've got to a point where I'm causing pigment separation because there's just too much fluid yeah. and not enough pigment. Yeah, it can't support it, yeah. That blend is lovely. Yeah, it's not too shabby, is it? That's nice, it's looking good. No. Yeah. It's uh Trying to get like the definition of the folds in and everything, and then uh, we'll basically here with some glazes. And when we've done all that, exactly. we'll reward ourselves with doing the face. Nice. So my plan um, later in the week, whichever day I manage to land on, and I will advertise it on Twitter and stuff, is to to broadcast a little later because I want to try and go out at a time where we can give the sort of LA crowd a chance to be in the, the East Coast and West Coast guys both need a, a mutually accessible time. It's difficult, you know, that's the that's the flip side of being global, isn't it? You try and cater to all these different time zones, you end up broadcasting at four in the morning. Yeah, it's interesting because I, I generally find myself sometimes quiet during the day at sort of like one, two o'clock, I've stopped for a spot of lunch and I'm like, oh, I might do a stream. And then you realise yeah. that even people in the UK are all kind of still at work and I get loads of kind of messages from people saying, why are you streaming at this time? I can't watch while I'm at work. Can you please not do that anymore? <laughs> it's not a popular option, is it? Nah. Have you ever used the chameleon colour changing paints? This is something I have what? literally no experience at all with. No. I don't even know what one of those is. Nasty <laughs> Butler, please enlighten us. Are they real? Is it close to April? I'm going to assume that they're real because I am, you know, I have optimistic faith in the uh, purity of the human spirit. So, uh, in in a in a time not too far from now, I will be disappearing off to uh, complete the. I've been constructing, and that's the best word for it, um, vegetarian uh, steak burgers like quarter pounders right. um which is a fairly arcane process that involves making a strange dough and boiling it and making it become meat like so uh, i'm gonna go be checking on those shortly which would be has your missus gone veggie as well she has yeah yeah we are we are united yeah as that makes life things, easier it does honestly i think it's it's safe to say that i would struggle I mean, now that I'm now that I'm in fully engaged with it, I'm finding it not just easy, but actually a net be benefit. But I don't think I would have done it without without Kate. And, without Kate, uh, so, no. Yeah. Like most things in life, you know. It's easier with a bit of teamwork. You see, it? teamwork makes the dream work. It was like yesterday. I cut, so I cooked a nice bit of roast lamb. And that was for me and Tom. My missus doesn't like lamb, so uh, I ended up cooking her um, some chicken. And my daughter decided that she she randomly is veggie. And uh, yesterday she decided at the last minute she was vegetarian for that Sunday, so I ended up cooking her an omelette. So I cooked three meals yesterday. You cooked three separate meals. That is that is some uh, dedication to the family cause right there. Yeah. Well, did you, you did you know I was a um, I was a professional chef for some time? I did not know that. That is that yeah. is new information. Yeah. There aren't there don't seem to be many career not not professions but sort of industries at least that you've not had your hand on at some point. At some point. I like you know I like to sort of try new things. You could tell me that you played centre forward for Arsenal. I probably believe you. Oh, only. It's interesting you saying about like you know cooking three meals and family duties. I I was fortunate enough off the back of posting the critical role models to be having a chat with Liam the other day, and I suddenly realised I was chatting with Liam at like 
one o'clock in the afternoon. And I, th- I thought to myself, you're in LA. And sure enough, he was telling me he gets up at 5 a.m. every day. Oh, my God. Just, uh, that's what's required. That's what he needs to do to make sure his kids are all sorted and all the family duties are done before he goes off and does his acting work. That's um, fair play to him. Yeah. Hats yeah. off to the guy. Right, Green Stuff World is selling two different sets of colour-changing paint. They are meant to be used through an airbrush. The range has multiple colours that shift to another colour in the light. He was thinking of picking them up for Wraith Marid. Oh man, Wraith Marid look amazing in a colour-changing paint. Oh, well, like in a pearlescent kind of. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'm down with I'm, that. I'm, think- I'm thinking like, yeah, I- I'm assuming like that stuff you see on cars, all those, you know, like on a beetle. Yeah. A VW like beetle or a actual beetle beetle. Yeah, no, like oh. the iridescent kind of... Yeah. Well, if that's what we're talking about, that would look amazing. I, I have no experience of this, but it sounds great. Right. We are getting somewhere. Let's... Uh, a little bit of a highlight now. Now, I've got an interest. I, it's not an interesting question. It's just a question. I'm interested in the answer. All right. Um, where you've colour shifted down into a darker fabric. Yeah. So effectively, you're doing the opposite of highlighting because you're taking it darker and darker. Yeah. Would you still hit the edge with a, with some sort of bounce highlight just to define the edge of the fabric? Or would you be happy to leave it at its darkest point around that edge? Uh, I would. So I did um, a little kind of just a real warm-up practice piece, and I don't know if it came through, but I did. I would go through and just put like a little highlight just on the edge there just to kind of give it a little bit of definition um i'm with you yeah just oh, it's a boy ox yeah poor ox that that model gets painted so many different ways <laughs> that model weighs three times what it weighed when we first sent it to you is it probably oh it does now it layers of paint it's got so much paint on it See the last word in home defence, just club a burglar with it. Well, this is another handy use for god-tier models. Oh my lord, those things. Forget sock jacking. A rangosh to the face and you're not waking up for a month. So just talking Uh, about what we were doing, um, just while I'm doing this, so these highlights on these folds are quite gentle, so I've actually been cross-hatching them and trying to smooth them out a little bit, whereas on these creases, this is what we're talking about... um, with a with a slightly more specular highlight is a crease in a cloth will sh- give you a, a, a more sharper highlight than one a, of the things that you one of the things that I'm doing when I'm sculpting and then you're reinforcing with this is the the level of depth uh, the level of contrast between the shadow and the highlight your brain is going to read that as tension yeah so um, when I'm sculpting, I'm I'm physically putting that into the model in different degrees, and then you get to enhance and and reinforce that effect with the paint. So uh, you're you're basically you're feeding the dynamic action line into the model through the tension of the cloth. And if if I've done my job properly, then by following those folds, it should reinforce the pose. Yeah, and if if you've done your job well, it makes it a lot easier for me to kind of see where i need to go as well it's absolutely key i think that's i mean certainly something we focused on 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 the god tier models i know more and more um lessons that we learned from the back end of you know the later guild ball models was, was sure. definitely making the models easy to paint but also by making them easier to paint they're actually easier to paint well yeah i mean the ultimate articulation of that is on a guild that one of the minor guilds that we've worked on that has not been announced yet, so we can't talk about it. But you know, I I look at them and I'm like, yeah, they are they are the the best that Guild Ball has, and and rightly so because they're our most you know our most up to date work. But uh, you haven't seen I I am in the lucky position of seeing things before you have um, the uh, the alternate version of Rangosh because obviously the the god tier models that people have seen were the early access poses. Yeah. And so the sculpt team has been working on the versions that will be available for the, when the game releases. And the new Rangosh is just such a boss. It's unbelievable. Really? I'll send you it tomorrow. Yeah, my brother had a couple of minor anatomy things he wanted to finish before he sent it over to you. But you wait till you see this guy. He oh, is right. an absolute monster. Forward to that. 
Right. There's no real rhyme or reason to this paint painting. I'm kind of painting on in instinct at the moment. Just working. I think that's okay. I mean, I don't think you always have to have a process. I certainly work across a model and paint the things that interest me. I mean, there's a sense of the old onion skin. You know, you work from the inside out just yeah. for convenience, but... Not so easy, easy on this this model, actually, just because of the um, the colour transitions. Now, you you know, I didn't have to kind of follow the artwork, although what would be the point of having amazing artwork if we weren't going to follow it? Well, yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's no secret that the artwork that Ariana has done has informed the the sculpting so of course we want it to we want to pay homage to the work she's done because she worked directly with the cast so these are as close to what's in their heads as you're going to get so naturally yeah. you want to you want to express that on the model yeah one of the things that's interesting from uh for, for me watching this is I think that the the camera you've got on your palette may be slightly more colour saturated than the camera that's watching the miniature and yes, feels... weird because the one on my palette is by far and away the older less good camera, allegedly but... it definitely feels like you're taking a more saturated colour and it's looking a little a little less so yeah I'm slightly happier with the colour that I've got tonight as compared to yesterday. Uh, I did spend a little time messing about with the... Yeah, it was a little blue yesterday. Yeah, so hopefully it's a little bit less blue today. But uh... Right, what have we got going on across her face? So it's um, this stuff here is all still this kind of dark colour, isn't it? So Yeah, it's like a blue... Blue grey kind of slate colour, really, isn't it? Yeah. And again, hats off to Ariana. One of the things that I became very, very clear on as I worked through the uh, through the art when I was doing these sculpts is how clever she is in establishing a like a unique palette for each character. The c her colour choices are really considered, and it's really nice. Yeah. Although if we could just have a little word about transitioning from like light green to really dark blue, that would be cool. <laughs> I'm interested to know what she worked in. I assume these these were digitally painted, but they've got a lovely kind of almost gouache feel to the to the art. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if these were. It, like if you look at the the close ups, you sent me a link to a bunch of close ups that um... I did, yeah. In the background, you can see like the more high detail version, and yeah, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be stunned if these ended up being um, actual illustrations and then sc then scanned. Well, if that's the approach she's taken, then well, I mean, it doesn't matter what medium she's worked in; she's extremely talented. Yeah, and uh, I say that as someone who I I I, I have a slight issue when. Uh, it's lovely when people tell you you're talented, but you were like, yeah, I, I thank you. I've also worked really hard. I can appreciate how hard she has worked to master her art. Right. All right, so what I'm doing here is uh, I'm actually blocking out like the um, zenithal volumes here. So I'm just trying to create a tonal difference between the upper surfaces and the lower surfaces of the same colour. And then I'll go This has become and... a... Sorry. No, you're right. Go on. I was going to say, this has become a very prevalent painting technique in recent years. Um, I think that very much you could almost describe the earlier version of what people consider high-quality painting to be a sort of ambient style where you you blend and color the model and and work on the highlights and the shading but the lights kind of a directionless you know yeah. the model is lit uniformly from every direction the idea that you work with the with a uh, an imagined light source is very recent and 
it really can bring a model to life. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a very um, European technique. It gives you, a, I think, it gives you a much more realistic look to your model. Whereas yeah. the other way is possibly a little bit more striking, but a little bit less realistic when you actually pick the model up and have a look at it. Uh, There's a lovely comment from, uh, I'm going to assume that's DMC Lieberman, um, who says that these are the first models seen in quite a while that uh, they would choose to uh, paint without converting as a long-time green stuff converter of figures. That's very kind of you to say so. Nice. I think, again, we have to uh, refer back to Ariana's art, though. She gave us such strong, you know, she's given the critter community such a strong set of character designs that all I had to do was basically not deviate too far, and I, I was on to a winner. Yeah. I think there's a certain degree of, like, I don't, I mean, I don't know what shops people go to, but, like, in England, we have shops like Next and River Island and stuff like that, and I don't like buying stuff from there because I just have visions of walking down the street and seeing someone else with the exact same t-shirt on. <laughs> and um, so I kind of like to try and sort of be a bit more esoteric with where I get my kind of t-shirts from. Although that being said, it backfired spectacularly when I went to Salute uh, one year and saw someone with the exact same cool, zom unique zombie t-shirt that I thought I had, uh, which my friend thought was absolutely hilarious. But then that's because he's a dick. <laughs> you take Sherwin's approach to things and only in, you know only enjoy things like eight years after everyone else has forgotten about Oh it. my god, they are unbelievably. I've uh, coined a new phrase. He's not an edge lord. He's a hedge lord because he's a hipster and an edge lord. <laughs> That's genius. It's also Sherwin to a T. Kate right. has just sent me a photograph. Okay, so my wife has sent me a photograph from the from downstairs because I'm on the first floor of the uh, house of my dog collapsed with a toy in his mouth she has finally worn him out which is an achievement because he's a spaniel wow see that's why uh, I have a Labrador infamously yeah. lazy and mm. now a tiny little chihuahua <laughs> Who likes nothing better than to sit on my desk and just fall asleep and he sits there all day i can imagine that having a chihuahua is not unlike having a cat in terms of where they go and how they can sleep and stuff yeah because my cat used to just lie along my keyboard and sleep in front of my monitor and cause me no end of trouble your cat not with us anymore no, he just doesn't come and stay with me anymore. Oh. He's got it was it was one of those fleeting we'd moved to a new house, he wasn't as comfortable in it, so he was seeking reassurance. And as soon as he got it, you know, once he got his feet under the table, I never saw him again because he was a cat. Yes. There you go. I've said it. Actually, no, that's not true. I don't mind cats. I would just would have a dog 99 times out of 100. They say that the world splits into cat people and dog people generally, don't they? Yeah. I get it with cats, and I, I you know, I definitely, cats are cool in some ways, but um, I like the uh, unrequited loyalty and love that you get from a dog. Now, my friend Fred will tell you that his cats show him that, that same kind of, I'm really pleased to see you, and I'm like, I do not believe you. No, they're really pleased to see the person that's going to give them food. Right. I think that until you've owned a dog, you can think your cats are pleased to see you. But, you know, every time you walk through the front door, it's like your dog's gone to Disneyland. Yeah. And you realise the cats really don't care that much by comparison. When the dog's like, oh my god, oh my god, you've been gone so long. And you're like, I've just had a pee. Literally yeah. just had a pee. It's been literally 30 seconds. All right, we're looking good. So let's just get a little bit of um, brown on this this stuff right i am gonna temporarily bow out uh, i will return shortly i hope but i need to go and check how my vegetarian burgers are doing before i boil them to uh into shoe leather fair so, enough uh, i'll speak to I you will, in a minute i'll jump on back shortly wait all right
I've had a few people kind of um, ping me, sort of say, oh, I'm going to get into painting minis and try and uh, get some tips and stuff. And the best tip is, is really learning how to um, control the uh, fluidity of paints, I think would be one of the best things. I would suggest people kind of learn. Uh, I've got a great day in English Mastiff named Jacob. Oh, Jacob, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Passed out in the middle of the floor with his arms out like Superman. Dogs are the best. Dogs are the best. Please tell me that's not a little chip. That's so annoying. Right, what colour are the tides? So they are this kind of sort of sky bluey sort of colour. All brand new colour in there. I am back. Awesome. Just noticed so, that there's a uh, there's an additional colour blue in there. I thought I had the full palette, but there's um there's like a sky blue. Or a Tesla blue kind of Oh this paint's gonna explode everywhere. I've done that before live on stream. Did it's... you answer the question what brushes you're using? Uh, I did not, no. Um, so I am currently using, I alternate between, uh, I've got a Broken Toad brush um, from the excellent Chris, um, brokentoad.com, and uh, I also use uh, Winsor and Newton's um, miniature series, Series Sevens. I use the long bristles. Yeah. I don't use the um, the short bristle ones. Uh, and then I also use uh, Raphael um, 404s, eight four oh four, just because I like the uh, the long bristles. But don't tend to have a particular rhyme or reason as to the what brushes I use. I I'm quite abusive to my brushes, so. Whatever one's in the is the newest one is the one that I'll use the most when I need to really have good point control, and then it's generally down to size after that. So I'm using the four oh four. Uh, sorry, I'm using a series zero size zero broken toad for this model just because there's quite a lot of little intricate pieces of detail, and also because I want to get that um, cross hatching kind of feel to the the highlights uh, whereas Caleb um, that we painted yesterday um, I did with a Winsor Newton series 7 because there was a lot more kind of open surfaces and it was a lot more about glazing and blending so I just wanted the brush that had a, a bigger body to it that's any help that's fair. I, in a similar way, I'm a Series 7 guy for the most part. But like yourself, I find I'm quite hard on brushes. So I will also... I, I tend to find that there's one brush that's a real workhorse. It's usually about a size 1. Yeah. And with Series 7s, you can do you know, you can do pupils in eyes with a size 1. And you can do base coating with a size 1. Yeah. Um, but uh, when you see these painters who are like, and I've had this brush for 12 years now, I have no idea how they're doing that. Uh, no. They've just got yeah. too much time to kind of clean their brushes properly, I think. And they're with their brush, you know, the, you've got your brush soap and your acrylic cleanser and all the rest of it. And if you've got time to do that, that's awesome. But like a Series 7 brush is £8. It's not a big investment every three or four months. Huh. I 100% I agree, except... I don't think it's a big investment to buy a new brush every month. <laughs> well, you know, you're rolling on that sweet, sweet director's oh, level. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, oh. those broken toe brushes are really great. I'm really, really impressed with them. Sorry, that's in answer to a chat message. Right. I found they're very good for blending. They've got a nice sort of feathering. Yes. The, the, the spear tip or chisel tip, whatever they're called. Oh, I've got one here. Let me show you. Um... So this one here is a uh, is a spear tip. So as you can see, it's kind of uh, it's flat in one way and then 
sort of spear shaped in the other way if you look at the profile of the of the ferrule so it makes it very easy to kind of um glaze with and and two brush blend yeah right we're nearly at the best part of the day Paint in the face it is the moment so i'm i've interpreted those rings as being made of jade oh did you so, yeah those those rings hanging mm. off that that thread i i assumed were meant to be jade so i think that's I probably go a bit greener i think you could get away with being a bit greener all right let's um possibly the same with the um the gathers at the bottom there right i'm literally digging up the um the artwork i'm digging up the tumbler just so i can have a quick look without uh, the overlay yeah, well, i've got a good great jade color yeah those are definitely two bits of jade i reckon right She's got a jade bracelet and a jade necklace as well. I didn't put the bracelet on because it would have been so small, but I've put a necklace in there that could be jade if you wanted a, no, I... another place to echo the colour. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so okay. let's go in and turn these into jade then. I'm excited to see if, if and when we get to paint Molly what you're going to do with all of the crazy suns and moons and patterning all over his clothing. Oh my god. Yeah, I saw saw him the other day. I'm like, oh, thank you so much. Talas had said that he, he his brief to the artist was create me a costume that will make cosplayers cry. And painters. And That's painters. I think cosplayers are any, have an easier time of it. you just got to find the right material. <laughs> Somewhere in the internet, a thousand cosplayers scream with rage. You know nothing. It's not all cardboard boxes and gaffer tape. I'm definitely someone who enjoys the efforts that people go to with cosplay. I do not understand why. I, can, I admire the craftsmanship of it. Uh, you know, I've 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 watched a few videos where you see the the work going into the construction, and it's what some of these people do is just incredible. Yeah. I, I take my hat off to it. It is a genuine modern kind of craft slash art form that you know twenty odd years ago just didn't exist, and it's amazing to see that you've got this really exciting way that people can express themselves. At the same time, there's just no way I could do it for a start. I'm too old and too bold and too fat. Who who would you cosplay as? Who do you think you you would most closely represent? Oh man. I don't know. Come on, surely you've all this. Uh, I genuinely haven't. That's a really difficult question. Uh, I'll tell you what actually. Uh, <laughs> this is <laughs> I think I could do a fairly good Eddie Hitler from Bottom. <laughs> <laughs> See, I could do a really good Grant Mitchell from EastEnders. Yes, I can see that. <laughs> but I don't know if that's a decent cosplay or not. Right, my brother has just messaged me because he's watching the stream to yeah. say that I could be Roadhog. Oh the my... Grotes the grotesquely overweight character from Overwatch. So thanks for that, Ben. Cheers, nice, mate. Nice, nice one, Ben. I'll dig around tomorrow for all the really rubbish jobs that we've got on the slate and I'd send them all his way. Well, I, I would point out how similar you both look. Well, there is also that. <laughs> it is a bit like him doing a your mum joke. There is, de there is definitely a bit of pot calling the kettle black there. Are you allowed to say that anymore, actually? I just suddenly realised. No, of course you are. Yeah. That's just an old saying, isn't it? It is. I oh. don't think that's considered rude. Well, I'm sure Bryce will tell me tomorrow. Thank you to the person in the chat that's just said that I could be Varys from Game of Thrones. Oh. <laughs> Genuinely, like joking aside, if anyone's aware of um, the people behind Penny Arcade, 
uh, it is kind of scary how much I look like um, uh, Tycho, the uh, Jerry. Really? Yeah, really scary. Well, in My real life or in the cartoon? Uh, in real life, he 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 even actually has the same glasses as me, the same same set of glasses. We are quite spookily similar. Uh, my daughter asked to cosplay Honor for Adepticon because of the pin you gave her. <laughs> oh, isn't awesome. That, isn't that just the best <laughs> story? Yes. I said was woo. Oh, is that my favourite little girl, is it? I get cards off her and all sorts. That's amazing. Yeah. That's why we do what we do. Decided to use your beading to just give it a little bit of life on the edge of the cloth with a sort of starkish that's it, highlight. That's what, that's what it's there for. Yeah. Right. I'm going to disappear for realsies now. Are you off? Going to eat your I, steak? I'm, I'm going to disappear to eat my, my fake steak. See how that's worked out. All right. Um, if I don't get back before you finish, gentlemen, ladies, and people in between that have joined us, it's been lovely chatting. And uh, keep an eye on the, the Twitter sphere for when uh, we're up on the live scope later in the week. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, Mr. Hart, I will speak to you tomorrow. All right, bud. Yeah, give a shout in the morning. Will do, mate. All right, mate. Have okay, right, let's do the face. What skin colour does Bo have? I um Russ is sort of saying it's like Hispanic y sort of colour. Um I don't know, it's definitely got olive tones, so I'm gonna go with um this is a scale colour basic flesh, um which has a bit of a bit of a darker kind of base layer to it than Snapchat. And what I'm gonna do is you nick a bit of this green ink green from the wash just to go in and give me a slightly greener base colour. Okay. <laughs> Very quiet yeah. without Russ, I miss him. Don't envy him eating a um Whatever he's eating, though. Sitting there watching on the on his phone. Oh no, Russ is Russ is a gentleman. He'll be uh, chatting away to his missus. So we'll still use the same kind of technique for the flesh, get a flesh wash in here. Oh, is it cool to wait? Oh, I can eat them, yeah. Better wrap this up and then find some grub.
Yeah, she looks a little bit Indonesian. Got that definite sort of slightly sort of Asian feel skin in the artwork. One more coat, and then I think we're good to kind of get a highlight on. All right, get a flash wash on that, and then um, while that's drying, we work out what we're going to do. So hopefully what you get from watching me paint is there's no real sort of secret to it. It's just the uh, same thing, zinc wash, highlight, a bit of shade, and that's tiny a lot. That gives me a better skin tone. All right, what we're going to do is... hitting the glaze over the bottom. Help smooth a little, get the transitions up.
All right, not looking too bad. There. So go back in on the face. Always the same technique. Top of the nose. Top of the nose. Nice bit of separation and then we're gonna go under the eyes. Get the top lip and inside of the bottom lip in. Some red lips. Is so heads tilted over that way, so this side can be a little bit more. So I don't want to give a super amount of definition on the muscles. I think it ends up looking like she's been hitting the, uh, the weights a bit too much. Fine, I just think you lose a little bit of femininity of femininity, whatever. not careful she can end up looking a bit too manly oh bad What colour hair? Dark hair. Oh, that. Oh, sorry.
A little bit of a glaze just where there's a little bit of shaving on her head. Right, so while the hair's drying, we'll go in and do a little bit of glaze work on the uh, on the face. So that's a little bit of red ink. Down. This is definitely more. You don't want it to look like they're too much lip. End up looking like the Joker if you're not careful. Mm, too much. Oh, yes. There, pretty happy with that face so far. Mm. Maybe she's been people in the head. All right, and we we'll get a little bit of green. Really careful because give her a five o'clock shadow. Definitely want to give her feeling skin in it slightly with the green. Oh, I'm pretty happy with that. Not a million miles away from done. Let's just do the 
হ্যাঁ All right. I think that'll do it for now. I'll do the base. Let's have a little zoom in just so you can get a view of what she looks closer. Oh, it was in being a bit too far, losing a little bit. Camera colours are still not right, so in in real life she's a lot more saturated. Uh, I'm going to go in with a little bit of glazing just to really pull those blues into being blue. Um, probably hit the skin again a little bit with some green, but I think that will do it for tonight. Um, I'll finish her off and I'll get some pictures out so you can see the final version of her. But hopefully you enjoyed that. Um, thanks ever so much for joining us. I will love you and leave you. And then like Russ says, next stream on this channel will probably be him sculpting um something something exciting and um i think he said he was aiming for wednesday so we'll see how that pans out but until i see you next time take it easy